Good morning everybody. Before we begin with the word, let's come before the Lord in prayer, commit the message to him. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, I thank you for this time. I ask, Lord, that you would use this imperfect vessel and bring revelation from your word to help to encourage, to build, to challenge, to correct, rebuke, whatever is needed, Lord, in your church, in your body. Commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we are with the third message in our series on the tabernacle and its furniture, the tabernacle and its furniture. We're going to look at the menorah today, the lampstand or candlestick as it's put in the King James. I want you to turn with me first though, if you will, to Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, we're going to start at verse 13. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 13. I'm going to read to verse 16. We'll begin at verse 13. Matthew 5, verse 13. And in this scripture, in Matthew, we have the following statement from Jesus himself to his disciples. Verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Praise God for his word. This might seem, although an encouraging statement by the Lord Jesus to his disciples, on the other hand, it might seem somewhat of an off-the-cuff comment. They're the light of the world. However, it was an announcement that an Old Testament physical type or symbol was being fulfilled or going to be fulfilled in them and by them. This type or symbol was in fact the menorah, or as it's translated in the Old Testament in the King James as candlestick. It is this menorah, which is, menorah is the actual Hebrew word there that is translated as candlestick in the King James. It's this menorah that we're going to be examining today. In this third, in our series, as I said, on the tabernacle. So let's get straight into it. Let's look at this candlestick, this menorah. Now there may be some confusion as we begin our study on this subject as to whether it is a candlestick or whether it is a lampstand. The Hebrew word as I've said in the King James is translated as candlestick. It is though in fact as I've already mentioned the Hebrew word menorah, which means a lampstand, simply a lampstand. However, it has the root meaning derived from the word manor, the Hebrew word manor, which means a yoke. And that for, for ploughing, the type of yoke that is used to uh, bring two animals together. It's a frame or a loom or a beam. That's the root word of this word menorah. Now let's go to Exodus chapter 25 and verse 31. This is where we see for the first time this word used, 
Exodus 25, verse 31. And it says this, Exodus 25, verse 31. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold, of beaten work shall the candlestick be made, his shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knops and his flowers shall be of the same. That's the first time that we see this word, this translated candlestick, or menorah, as the proper word is, is found in the Old Testament. So we can see therefore that it's, it's a frame or a yoke which carries or supports lamps. That's its purpose. It could not be a candlestick as candles were neither available nor practical in Old Testament times. In the New Testament, the word translated candlestick is actually the Greek word luknia, luknia. And that also means a lamp stand. If we look at Hebrews chapter 9 verse 2, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 2 says this, For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick, and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. That word candlestick there in Hebrews is our word look near. Lamps were used atop a lampstand, which were kept full of oil by the priests, whose duty it was, and always had been, to keep them trimmed and alight at all times. That's what a menorah is. It's a lampstand with lamps on top of it. The standard menorah has seven lamps. There's a central lamp, and there, are, and there are three branches, if you will, coming from each side of the central column, each having a lamp on top of it. So you end up with a, a lamp stand with seven oil lamps on the top of it, on seven branches. Now the purpose of the menorah. Let's look at the purpose of the menorah now. We've seen what a menorah is. Let's see what its purpose was. Now when instituted by the command of Almighty God in Scripture, we already read in Exodus 25 verse 31, the purpose of this lampstand, this menorah, was to provide light or illumination in the holy place. Now this holy place was the second of three sections of the Old Testament tabernacle and of course subsequently in the temples both of the Old Testament and of the New Testament. They all carried the same kind of structure, formation with three basic parts to them. There was the outer court, the holy place and the most holy or the holy of holies as we will see as we go through. Now inside or within this holy place or Kodesh in Hebrew were three pieces of furniture. One was of course a lampstand, the menorah. The other two were the altar of incense and the table of showbread. Now these two we're going to look at in subsequent studies but we're going to mention them and talk about them here briefly as it uh, entails the holy place. Now the holy place was the first section of the tabernacle where only the priests were allowed to be and to minister. This place was completely enclosed on all sides with an entrance that was covered by a veil or a thick curtain. There was a veil into the holy place from the outer court and there was a veil or a curtain from the holy place into the holy of holies. 
And it was a place, the holy place, was a place where uh, only, as I said, the priests had access. The outer court was a place where anyone could bring their sacrifices to the Lord. The holy place was the first place that was separated and that was for the priests. The holy place was a place of both offerings and also of prayer for the priests. The table of showbread had 12 loaves of bread on it and next to it on the floor was the libation offering a jug of wine basically which we'll as said we're going to discuss in later studies there was also the altar of incense which had on it burning coals and upon which was sprinkled the incense which sent up a perfumed smoke into the holy place this stood directly in front of the other curtain or the veil which led into the Holy of Holies. The table of showbread being on the opposite wall, against the opposite wall to the menorah. The menorah was placed on the south side of the tabernacle. The table of showbread was placed on the north side of the tabernacle, the holy, holy place. The altar of incense was placed to the north directly outside the veil which led to the Holy of Holies. So I hope you get that picture now of the placement of this furniture within the Holy Place. As I've said, the Holy Place was a place of preparation. It was a place of sacrifice it was a place of prayer and it was a place of preparation for the high priest to go into the Holy of Holies on that one day a year called of course Yom Kippur the Day of Atonement the main purpose then of the menorah the lampstand was to provide light in this dark place to illuminate the place of separation from the world, if you like. A place of sacrifice and preparation, as I've said, to come into the very presence of Almighty God. Does this sound familiar at all? A place of preparation before we come into the presence of Almighty God. So then, the menorah was all about illumination. It was all about revelation of that which would otherwise be hidden in the dark. The light from this lampstand, this menorah, produced by the seven individual lamps that sat on top, shone towards the north side of the holy place, as I've said, towards the table of showbread. The lampstand, as I've said, being placed on the south side, and the lamps with the wick in them, the oil-filled lamps with a wick, and each lamp was turned so that the wick faced north towards the table of showbread. So if you get the picture, you have the lamp stand standing uh, flat parallel against the south side of the tent the holy place and the lamps themselves were turned at a 90 degree angle so that the wicks the light that it produced faced the north side where the table of showbread was positioned now I'm emphasizing this quite heavily because there's a great significance to this placement prophetically as we're going to see shortly however first it's it's important to point out the fact that the lampstand itself was made from one single piece of gold 
we read that in the verse that we read in Exodus 25. One single piece of gold and it was beaten into shape by hand. Now from scripture we read that in Hebrews 2 verse 10 it says this. Hebrews 2 and verse 10 says this. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now I just wanted to mention that because as we said, as we will acknowledge as we go through this whole series, each piece of furniture, each part of this tabernacle has prophetic significance pointing to the life and work and the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to point out here that this menorah, this lampstand was made from one single piece of gold and it was beaten by hand into shape. Beating something into shape means that it was forcibly shaped from the outside, doesn't it? And the scripture that we read in Hebrews 2 verse 10 is describing that the Lord Jesus Christ, the captain of our salvation, was made perfect through his sufferings. He suffered persecution. He suffered humiliation. And that for our sake. It's already been stated that the lamps themselves were separate entities, if you like, and were placed on top of this lampstand. The lampstand, remember, is the root word was yoke. A yoke, a framework, a, a support, if you like, that was made for the lamps to sit on. And I hope that you'll be able to begin now to see the prophetic significance of this picture of the menorah in the holy place. I pointed out earlier that the root word for menorah describes a yoke. The yoke was a form of device which brought two or more beasts of burden in order to perform specific tax, tasks such as ploughing and so on. So when I tell you that the menorah, the lampstand, represents the Lord Jesus Christ, it should bring into mind the following scripture to you. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. I'm going to read from verse 25 to verse 30. Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hidden these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, he to whomever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me all that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I want to say, brothers and sisters, that this particular scripture perfectly describes the picture of what was happening in the holy place when the lamps were lit. Briefly, because we're going to look, as I said, at them in greater detail in forthcoming studies, in future studies, the bread represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the wine, the libation offering, represents his blood. It's, it's what we uh, 
celebrate, if you like, when we take communion, the bread and the wine. It's the same thing, it represents the same thing, the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, symbolically, prophetically, in the tabernacle. There is so much tied up in this picture. We're going to try and make it clearer so that we can all clearly understand what's going on, what's meant here in this prophetic picture to us today. The menorah, the lampstand itself, as we have said, represents the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The individual lamps represent the believers, the church, if you like. The light is the Holy Spirit. The lamps containing the light point towards the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ prophetically. Can you see that? Do you see this picture? In fact, this picture is, we won't go into it now, but it's, it's, the picture is repeated in Revelation chapters 1 and the first part of 2, where Jesus is seen walking amongst the lampstands, the menorah. And he talks about the, uh, the menorahs representing the church. The church having Christ living within us. We are one with him. Now in the discourse which is called the Beatitudes, Jesus himself gives us this glorious fulfilling picture of the church. Turn with me to Matthew 5, if you will again. Matthew 5 verse 14 and 16. We already read it at the beginning of this message. But let's read it again because it's pertinent to what we're saying. Matthew 5, uh, chapter 5, excuse me. Matthew 5, verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle or a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick or a lampstand. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Brothers and sisters, there are so many prophetic pictures in that scripture. We could do a whole message on that. The city that is set on a hill. Speaking of the new Jerusalem. We are the light of the world. We are stones in this new city, this new temple. Our work is to shine to the unsaved, isn't it? To be seen, a light to all that are in the house. Now the word candlestick here, as I've already said earlier on, is the Greek word luknia, luknia, which is the same as the Hebrew word for lampstand. I hope that you can now see at least some of the absolute wonder of this prophetic picture that we are building which is the tabernacle all of this that we're talking about now in the room that was the place of preparation for the priest prior to entering into the very presence of almighty god and that only on that one day every year yom kippur the day of atonement don't you see, brothers and sisters, how privileged we are in this day, post the life, death, burial and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ? Can you not see the, the glory of it? That we can now come into that presence freely. We don't have to wait for that one day every year for someone else to do it for us. We can come in. But there is still a place for this room of preparation. This holy place before we come into that presence. We'll see that as we go on. Of course, we now have 
the very great privilege of, and honour of living in the time, as I said, after the death, burial, resurrection of our Lord. The veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies was torn in two from top to bottom, signifying that God had torn it, not man. The veil was torn in two from top to bottom, thus giving entry to all who would believe on the finished work of Calvary into the Holy of Holies, the very presence of Almighty God. What a wonder, what a privilege that is to behold and to, to consider in our minds. To come into the very presence of Almighty God and that to those of us who have been convicted of our sin by the Holy Spirit, have repented and been born again by the Holy Spirit through faith in the finished work of Calvary. Yes, it's not open for everyone. It's open to those who are in Christ Jesus. The purpose of the menorah then was to shed light upon the bread and the wine and the altar of incense, which incidentally represents the prayers of the saints. We'll see that when we look into the altar of incense at a later date. But this is what it represents. It's the revelation, it's the illumination of these things in the holy place. Every one of these items in the holy place were vitally important to the high priest in order that he may be right before God before he could go into the Holy of Holies, the very presence of Almighty God, before he could stand or bow down before the presence of Almighty God that appeared between the cherubim on that mercy seat. If he was not right with God, he would immediately be struck dead and have to be pulled out of that holy place back into uh, from the holy of holies sorry back into the holy place via a cord or a rope tied around him by his leg or his ankle or whatever by other priests so it's vitally important that he was in right standing with God that his sin had been covered, its sin had been forgiven. The prayer had gone forth and the right offerings had been made before he could go in. Now, conversely, in the day that we live, many in the church of Jesus Christ have forgotten that God is still the same. God is still holy. God is still righteous. God is still pure. And God is still awesome in his majesty. And that it's still necessary to be right before God, before we come boldly marching into his presence. That is why, brothers and sisters, and all who are listening this message, it is so important for us all who profess to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, to both understand what these physical types and shadows in the Old Testament mean and learn from them what we should do to maintain that cleanliness that the Lord Jesus Christ has imparted to us. What is most important to learn is that God is still the same God. He is still Almighty God. He is not our body is not our mate, is not our friend, he is creator of heaven and earth and all that exists within them. He is almighty, everlasting God. He is a consuming fire. No man can see God and live. This is true because of sin. The only man that can 
is the Lord Jesus Christ and that is because he is the God man as the scriptures declare he is very man and very God he is the only one who can stand before the very presence of God the Father because he came sinless and he died sinless but taking our sin upon himself as the perfect sacrifice once and for all time what we must remember brothers and sisters and anyone who does not yet know the Lord as their own personal saviour God can only see us or look upon us through his own son the Lord Jesus he is to all intents and purposes our great high priest the Lord Jesus and it's he who is continually in the Father's presence making intercession to him for us we will only be truly able to come physically into the presence of Almighty God when we have been transformed into the likeness of Christ and that will be when we meet the Lord in the air I believe at the rapture or as the Greek word gives it the harpezo the snatching away of the church no one knows no one knows when that day will be but looking at the signs that the Lord has given us it doesn't look that far away read Matthew 24 Luke 21 and you will see just how close we are so much more then the importance of us understanding the need for preparation to come into his presence so then I pray and believe you must see and understand that just as the high priest had to make sure that he was clean both physically and spiritually before he came through that veil into the Holy of Holies to face the very presence of God the Shekinah glory so we as believers must make sure that there is nothing in us that would or could contaminate us and make us defiled before our Lord when we either come before him in prayer or we come to worship him in a church meeting in a service etc next I want to look at the bearers of the light the bearers of the light we've been looking at the menorah and its purpose in the tabernacle and I hope this become clear to all of you that its purpose was to bear or to carry the light that light is as we know and understand today the Holy Spirit is the work of the Holy Spirit to reveal as we'll read in our next scripture two scriptures actually turn with me first to John 15 verse 26 John 15 verse 26 and it says this but when the comforter is come whom I will send unto you from the Father even the spirit of truth which proceeds from the Father he shall testify of me so there Jesus testifying that when he the Holy Spirit the comforter the spirit of truth is is calm whom he would send to us part of his work would be that he would the Holy Spirit would testify of him of Jesus he would reveal Jesus our next scripture is John 16 verse 13 to 15 John 16 verse 13 how be it when he the spirit is truth spirit of truth sorry is come he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself but whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak and he will show you things to come he shall glorify me for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you 
all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. So there you see part of the work of the Holy Spirit is to reveal. Reveal to the believers the things of Christ, the things of God, the hidden things of his word. Not only this, but he will reveal to the unsaved. Next scripture is John 16, verse 7 to 11. John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go unto my Father, and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the Prince of this world is judged. Now I've called this message, The Light of the World. The light of the world, as the menorah was the light in the holy place, shining light on these other pieces of furniture, these prophetic pieces. So the work of the Holy Spirit is to shine the light through us. Of the work of Christ. We as believers are here in this dark world in order to be light. Just as that menorah was there in a holy place to be light. We are to be the menorah to the world, the light to the world. As was said earlier in Matthew 5, 14 to 16, we, you are, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. We're not to be hidden. But there, where all can see, in the world, but not of it. I want you to see, brothers and sisters, and understand, though, in order for us to shine, we must first be in Christ. We must be one with him. Just as the lamps were on the lampstand and, and were counted as part and parcel of that menorah, then we must be filled with the oil. The oil is also a symbol of the Holy Spirit and a light. We need to be filled by the Holy Spirit and burning brightly in Christ. Can you see that picture? If one looks at the menorah, it is called just that, isn't it? It's not called the lampstand and the lamps. It's called the lampstand. It's called the menorah. It's considered one piece of furniture. And in like manner, we as believers are to be one with Christ, one in Christ. We are to be one in body, one in mind and one in spirit. We are to display the same disposition as he. Because in the end, our purpose is the same on this earth as it was for the menorah in the tabernacle. That purpose is to reveal Christ to the world. But the menorah revealed the bread and the wine. It also revealed the altar of incense, the importance of prayer. I've already said the, uh, the importance of prayer there in the holy place. Whereas with us as believers, we are to reveal Christ to the world. The finished work of Calvary, his body, his blood, and plus our willingness to pray to God and our faith to believe that God both hears and answers our prayer. We need to remember that a great part of our role here on earth as Jesus' disciples is to reveal him to the world. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 26 we recite this every time you take communion or you should do when we read the scriptures written by Paul. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you do show the Lord's death till he come. 
This was to be a public display of our faith in the death resurrection of our Lord. And so to tie all this together, brothers and sisters, to bring it to a conclusion. Bringing to a conclusion this part of our study about the lampstand, I hope that you, the listener, will be able to see as we look back through that finished work of Jesus Christ on Calvary that these physical types and shadows in the Old Testament still have an important and vital role for us as believers in our day. They're important because as the following scripture tells us in Romans 15 verse 4 For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Brothers and sisters, they are important in that they show us the continuing necessity to be clean and right before our Lord. Before we dare to come into his awesome and terrifying presence, it's vital for all of us to remember a very pertinent saying and I'll refer you to Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 Proverbs 9 verse 10 an important one if you don't remember anything else the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. We need to know and understand what these things represent and what they mean to us. So that the holy place as we have seen is a place of preparation before coming into the very presence of Almighty God and everything in there was an aid to that purpose. This is a symbol of our life now. This room is a symbol of our life now on this earth where we are. We are in the process of being conformed to the likeness of Christ Jesus. Being born again has made us free from the power and the punishment of sin. It has made us clean, washed us clean through his blood. Our task now is to remain clean as our Lord did throughout his own life here on the earth. Now we are to live in obedience to him and the leading of the Holy Spirit, maintaining as we go on the oil-filled lamps which are our lives in him, remembering the parable of the wise and unwise virgins in Matthew 25. We don't have time to go there now, but I advise you to read it because it's pertinent to our message. So then, as the menorah was seen as one piece of furniture in the holy place, let us all continue to be one with our Lord, one in mind, spirit and purpose. Until the time which is fast approaching, when we will meet him in the air and be as he is now. Keep your lamps burning bright, brothers and sisters, because the time is very near. I encourage you to join us next time when we will examine the table of showbread and the libation offering. But until that time, may God bless you and keep you. Amen.